Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, my name is Manesh. Uh, I'm Manesh Santani. I'm the editor at Regulation Asia. Um, in this next panel, Modeling Climate Risk, a Bank's Perspective, um, you know, we'll be looking at some of, some of the new expectations from regulators, financial authorities, um, at both a, a global and national level, um, you know, expecting banks to uh, be more prepared uh, for climate risk. Um, banks are being asked to model climate risk through scenario analysis and stress testing uh, to really understand their vulnerabilities to climate change and ensure they have the right systems in place to manage uh, the associated risks in their operations, loan portfolios, investments, uh, other stakeholder relationships, and so on. Um, so in this session, our panelists will discuss some of these expectations uh, for banks from regulators, uh, as well as some of the challenges the industry faces in trying to comply with these uh, in, uh, requirements. Um, so, so without further ado, I'd like to first introduce our panelists. Um, first off, we have Yves Tombali, Chief Risk Officer uh, at MUFG in Singapore. Uh, Yves has been with uh, MUFG in Singapore for uh, more than eight years, uh, covering market and liquidity risk. Um, he, he spent the previous decade at, at other banks as well. Um, and as I understand it, in, in, in your role, Eves, um, as, as CRO, you're, you are uh, very focused um, on meeting the, the MAS requirements on environmental risk. Uh, welcome, Eves. Thank you. Uh, great. You. And then we have Frederick Rowland, a Director of Technology and ESG Proposition at Walters Cloyer. Um, so Frederick joined Walters Cloyer in 2009. He's based in Belgium. Um, I, I know, uh, Frederick, you have a background in uh, data governance, uh, actuarial, and financial engineering. Uh, and I know your current focus is, is on working with the banks uh, across the globe in the U.S., Australia, Singapore, Hong Kong, Thailand, Philippines, and, and elsewhere, uh, with a focus on stress testing and modeling climate risk, uh, I, I guess, as well as sustainable finance generally. Welcome, Frederick. Yeah, very pleased to be here. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so, so I'd just like to quickly remind listeners, uh, you know, feel free to submit uh, comments uh, or questions through the platform, uh, and we'll we'll try to leave a bit of time towards the end to, to answer them uh, or address them during the discussion. Um, so to, to start off, I thought maybe at high level, uh, I could ask uh, you, Eves and, and Frederick, um, to, to kind of just talk about some of the current regulatory expectations when it comes to climate risk modeling and stress testing. Um, maybe you can also sort of explain uh, a bit about where these expectations are coming from and what the drivers in APAC um, are, uh, I guess, as well as internationally. Um, do you want to kick off, Frederick? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, I think when it comes to the regulatory expectations, I think um, the regulators are also in the same boat like other stakeholders, also the banks, financial industries, the vendors. So they're also finding their bearings, I would say. So they're also trying to observe it, to take stock of what's going on in the financial industry landscape. And I think at the moment, what, what we see, what they're particularly interested in is, um, I would say, what is the carbon intensity? Also something what Murat already uh, referred to. So which banks are basically funding a lot of emissions and which ones are, are not doing that? And basically to have a look at how the landscape looks like. So they're benchmarking of everything and baselining things out for themselves. Um, and at the same time, they're also looking at each other's shops. Uh, for example, if you read the APRA paper on the climate vulnerability assessment, you see that there's a, a straight comparison with what other uh, central banks have done. And they're also looking, of course, at converging some of those methodologies, methodologies because a lot of the financial, uh, financial uh, companies work, of course, world, worldwide. I think uh, what's also of interest is the carbon price because the carbon price is currently very volatile and I think they also want to get a sense of uh, how realistic or how real the, the carbon price is and does it is it the correct price to meet, for example, the Paris agreements, right? Um, of course, there's also a local aspect to it, especially when you look from regulator to regulator and especially when you look at physical risk. So that will change from, from region to region, country to country. And it's also important to think about downsizing all of those elements to, to local aspects. Uh, 
Um, one of the interesting things I, I found is that the Bank of England, who already did the study, and already published some of the results, is that uh, they already saw some really uh, mid, short, mid and short term and long term consequences, uh, mainly on the transition risk. Uh, let's say there were serious mid term consequences with the recession as a result. Uh, and for example, there were also some aspects that were interesting where they looked at a carbon price of 30 pounds at the time. And in the meanwhile, of course, we have just seen also in the session that it already increased to 70. So um, yeah, very interested in also seeing how, where this, this is going further. Uh, thanks, Frederick. Uh, Yves, would you have anything to add to that? Uh, sure, I mean, so the current situation is quite complex and, and uneven across uh, across the world. I mean, as Frederick rightly said, I mean, the, the push has started from Europe. Uh, we're seeing many banks there uh, leading the leading the approach and leading the development in the space. Um, and, and the rest of the world is kind of catching up. But for this time, actually, I think Asia uh, is ahead, um, more ahead than, than the U.S. Uh, because of the, the Trump era, uh, the U.S. has taken a bit of a step back uh, uh, compared to, to other countries, other parts of the world. Uh, they are suddenly catching up now. Uh, but what we are we are seeing uh, here in Asia is a very uneven uh, picture. Uh, Singapore is, I believe, leading the way. And um, we, we have a regulator here, the MAS, who has issued a paper in uh, guidelines in, in January 2020. And, uh, and we are now uh, looking to implement these guidelines. And uh, I believe they are on purpose uh, high level. Uh, they are expecting banks to, to take the time to uh, truly uh, um, study the approach that best fit uh, their current working environment and their uh, current constraints. Uh, but I believe that with time, uh, we will see uh, a more standardized approach come into play. I think that's what a lot of banks are now expecting. Uh, is a standardization of the approach of the methodology so that we can uh, more comfortably um, benchmark uh, ourselves to, uh, to this approach and start to move forward in the right direction together. Uh, now, as I said, uh, Singapore is leading the way. We're seeing some countries also uh, uh, issuing uh, guidelines. We've seen Australia. We've, we've seen the HKMA as well. Uh, I saw some questions on the chat about Taiwan. I'm not too sure what, where, where Taiwan is right now. Uh, but definitely, I think they're all looking at each other uh, to uh, to come up with a, a fairly s similar approach. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a, a combined approach as as uh, as they have in Europe, so that would probably uh, slow things down a bit. Uh, but definitely, uh, the Asia is certainly well aware of uh, uh, the progress that needs to be made in this space. Well, thanks so much, Eva, and 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 I'd like to to come back to you in a minute about kind of those 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 fragmented approaches. Um, but Frederick, if you don't mind, if I could ask you, um, you did mention a, a, bit, a bit about the Bank of England. Uh, we've briefly touched on the EU. Um, I, I suppose the, the UK and EU are, are seen as leaders in this space. Um, I, I wonder, Frederick, if you, might, if you might be able to talk a little bit about the approaches they, they've been using uh, and whether you expect um, APAC jurisdictions uh, to also adopt or follow similar approaches uh, or, or would they be going more of their own way? Yeah, I, th I think uh, it's a very interesting point uh, to make. Uh, will, will um, let's say, other re regulators follow <laughs> the lead in what, what Europe has been doing? Uh, I think uh, if you look at it from, from, from a journey perspective, I think a lot of similar stuff has been set so far. I think almost every regulator now has, at, at a, as a minimum, uh, a framework or a point of view with regards to to climate risk, right? So I think that's that's where most most regulators are. And then there's some, I think, uh, a few that went a little bit further. If you look at APRA, for example, with their publication on the climate vulnerability assessment. Uh, so there, there are already expectations to start stressing uh, climate risk in 2022 with some, some of the, the parameters there. Uh, and then also, for example, in Singapore, there's a commitment to also include uh, in the next year, next year, next year and a half, to also include climate risk in, in, in stressing. Um, I think when it comes to those papers and when those papers are published by regulators, there's always three key components uh, that we see coming back. Uh, 
Uh, one is uh, a qualitative assessment, so basically in the form of a questionnaire, uh, to basically to, to, to look at what's the, the view of, of the financial institution itself, obviously the quantitative aspect. And the quantitative aspect uh, is focused on the, on the stressing um, as an exploratory point of view, but also on the, on the metrics. And the metrics mainly uh, look at the finest emissions and the carbon intensity. And I think that's uh, what most regulators at this point want to get out of it, uh, get out of, of, of the banks from an information point of view. Um, what's also interesting uh, in the observations is that so far, all of the scenarios refer to the, the scenarios that are being used by the, net, uh, the network for greeting the financial system. So it's currently, at least at this moment, being seen as, as a bit of the golden standard there. So the scenarios used there are, as a minimum, normally a disorderly transition scenario. So basically, everybody will take action, but later than expected. And then the other scenario is the hot household scenario, where basically we don't take action. Uh, as a, uh, And then basically, that what impact that currently has, first of all, on the physical risk and the transition risk, and then translating those components to uh, credit risk and, and also the, the market risks. Yeah? So that's uh, an, an element that actually a rhetoric that comes back every time. Uh, also the time spans being used. Yeah? So there's always a short term, mid term, long term view uh, up to 2050. And I think the question is also what's going to happen now. Will we first go into a wave that everybody will align? And then depending on the, on the let's, say, let's say the regional differences, some uh, div divergence might happen. So I think indeed, like Eve said before, as well as that, I think uh, it can be expected that the first action is that the uh, alignment will happen or continue to be uh, happening. Uh, th thanks, Frederick. And, and coming back to you, Eves, um, I, I know you're in a unique position um, working at a, at a big Japanese bank uh, within Singapore, uh, but also having to, in your role, I suppose, having to pay attention to, to sort of global regulatory developments, um, as well as, um, you know, across the region. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about the different approaches used maybe in Singapore and Japan, or, or maybe uh, also what, you, what you're what you sort of um, uh, having to benchmark against, uh, you know, with different uh, jurisdictions under your purview? Uh, well, we're still at, at the beginning. I think, uh, you know, as you've seen, it was issued last year. Uh, I think that the regulators here in Asia are currently um, interviewing banks, uh, asking questions, seeing how the progress is happening. Um, after this, they will, I believe, look into um, issuing more constraints, more specific uh, requirements, uh, which will also help banks truly uh, to, to understand the, the way the regulator wants to go. Um, of course, banks are not waiting for regulators to, uh, to move forward. Uh, you've seen what our bank has already uh, committed uh, uh, for in terms of uh, net zero commitment for 2050. So we're working as a group um, on these uh, on these targets. And and what is important and what is sometimes can be can be a bit difficult uh, is to of course find a reconciliation between a global approach that has to meet uh, all the regulators that we face across the group. Uh, and a local approach that can sometimes have very different uh, expectations. So uh, we want to, uh, of course, uh, meet the local uh, regulations, but try as much as possible uh, to keep a global approach so that down the line we can, of course, uh, consolidate and stress that's our exposure globally and have a proper exposure and, uh, and also take action at the global level because, as, as you know, we have a lot of clients that we service across the world uh, and therefore, we need we need a consistent approach across this as well. Um, with regards to to some of the differences between um, jurisdictions, um, is it is it more of do you see it as more of just timing issues, or, or do you do you see the major difference in terms of the actual uh, requirements as well? And I suppose on top of that, um, I think it's difficult to say at this stage because the requirements yeah. are not yet fully defined. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know. As I said, the, 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 the guidelines, the MES's guidelines are high level on purpose. Uh, they mm -hmm. leave a lot of room for banks to define their methodology. So uh, I think those differences will become clearer and clearer as we move forward and the methodology becomes uh, uh, more specific. Uh, I think uh, 
right now what banks are, look, are, are looking at different solutions. There are uh, different models that already exist that allow you to uh, uh, map your exposure and stress test your exposure. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there isn't, uh, as I said earlier, a, a, um, a standard that is already uh, coming out as such, or particularly not in Asia at the, at the least. But I think as we move forward, that will become more uh, more apparent. Yeah, um, yeah, we've been we've been tracking the Asia Pacific developments fairly fairly closely, and it looks like um, you know a lot of the jurisdictions here um, have either have have essentially announced plans to conduct uh, to to require banks to conduct stress testing, scenario analysis, and so on. Um, so so yeah, yeah I, I suppose you know we're what we're really looking for in the long run is a convergence of of methodologies. Um, I suppose um when it comes to to climate risk modeling, there are uh, really a lot of uh, different risks to account for. <clears throat> um, so we're talking about, I know in the UK and EU, very long time horizons, thirty years and so on. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about future pathways of key reference variables. Um, you know, for physical risk, we're talking about, you know, floods, temperature increase, sea levels, uh, transition risks. There's always going to be changes in policy, technology, um, and so on. Uh, how, do, how do banks, uh, and I suppose, again, it's, as we've discussed, it's very early, uh, but how do you see banks addressing these risks in terms of, uh, in terms of the data component? How, how do they actually get their hands on the data to be able to, to, to stress test these um, different variables? Yeah, maybe I can uh, quickly uh, jump on that topic. So I think uh, what's uh, interesting in, in the conversations with uh, with multiple banks is that uh, from from what I hear, it's they're not their bread and butter, as they they would put it. So uh, typically, banks are are in the world of gathering financial data, and now suddenly they are asked to to basically add ad additional data dimensions, which they are not, not let's say, immediately comfortable with. Um, so they need to certainly the finest emissions is something very important because I think a lot of banks feel kind of watch, being watched at uh, because they're also not sure how much of their money goes to, to some of the industries and to which extent they are meeting a green objective. So that's, that's one thing. Uh, when it comes to physical risk, I think, uh, I think Murat also mentioned that before is that a lot of companies who already have experience with this and not not banks necessarily but at least insurance companies and reinsurance companies and there's also other external data providers so that's let's say on the positive side if you have those relationships may it's a good idea to also see if, if some of that information can be captured uh from from those external parties but what's also interesting i think is that uh, now with the loan originations, banks will need to set up processes to capture information. For example, something like a mortgage uh, for for a real estate. You will now probably at least what's what's happening in Europe. We see that they are asked to be providing information about energy performance uh, on that loan. So you need banks need to start gathering data about energy performance on real estate. But also when they talk to corporates and, and lending them new loans. They will ask questions about where is this money going to, but also mm -hmm. what are the emission reduction plans to, to, for example, measure the transition risk. And from I think the probably the most difficult part is the, the not for the new loans, right? But the whole portfolio of, of probably loans with a tenor of more than 20 years old. So how are you going to evaluate that? How are you gonna add those the data dimensions to that? So there. Uh, at least from what I see, also regulators push for proxies at the moment as uh, mm. uh, banks become more mature in, in gathering their data. Yeah, I, th I think you've highlighted um, kind of one of the, the, the key issues, uh, which is that, uh, you know, climate risk modeling is essentially very, very different from the traditional um, modeling that, that banks uh, would be used to by this point. Um, can, can you talk a bit more about some of those differences? Uh, I'm interested to uh, to kind of hear about, um, you know, kind of it's kind of a comparison between between uh, current modeling and sort of forward, more forward looking modeling, uh, which can extend um, to very long horizons, as we mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah, definitely. So. I, I think, yeah, like you mentioned correctly, their climate risk modeling and, and financial modeling are 
or or two different beasts uh, beasts to say uh and at the, what is happening at the moment is that the output of the climate risk modeling is normally the, should be the input of the financial modeling but um with that being said there's a lot of volatility coming around a lot of complexity involved uh with uh climate risk modeling so that auto automatically also affects uh, the financial modeling part. So basically you transmit a lot of external volatility into your, let's say, more standardized uh, uh, financial models, which you can also backtest. Uh, and, uh, and an additional fact is that climate risk models have feedback loops uh, are exponential in nature, where financial models are normally more linear. Uh, and then the additional complexity is that um, yeah, those, those uh, climate risk models are constantly updated. Eh? So um, yeah, the next heat wave, the next flooding, the, the next big droughts that comes around will be incorporated in those models and automatically uh, kicks into a feedback loop which will update that model again, uh, which will impact uh, your assessment. So at this moment, um, my my advice and, and what I also see in, in, in most banks is that you you have to focus on a good handshake between the climate risk model and the financial model to make sure that a good transition and that the, the output, uh, the sensitivities, the, the, the macroeconomic variables that you would use are, are the correct input for your financial modeling. modeling. And, and also, as Murat already said, I think everybody is also in need in, of, of a, a global carbon price, a kind of universal price or an index, because there is a lot of different ways of looking at different regulations. Uh, some companies are using, using internal prices. Others have a specific carbon tax regulations around that. So also there, especially in the transition risk, uh, more convergence is needed to basically uh, benchmark companies against each other, because otherwise it, it's, it's very hard to do so. Yeah, I, I suppose, um, you know, given all of those uh, unknown variables, um, you know, besides those those unknown variables and how they might change, um, regulators will also be asking banks, um, and some are already have, uh, but essentially to, to in integrate climate risk into sort of investment decisions, lending decisions. Um, maybe, Eves, if you could uh, give, give us a quick view, how, how challenging is this in terms of the data element? Is there actually sufficient data at the moment, or do you expect there to be uh, on the actual companies that a bank might be investing in or lending to for these types of assessments? Well, I think we're seeing an increase in data. That's for sure. There, there, yeah. I mean, it, it's a huge market, right? It's a, it's obviously going to be a very profitable market, and all the data providers are fully well aware of this. Uh, that's why we're speaking to Frederick right now as well in terms of modeling and in terms of data that will go into that system. Um, so in terms of producing the data, uh, it really depends on obviously the large companies uh, that have already been very actively engaged, already happily providing the data. Others are either not aware or not yet capable of, of provi providing that data. So we're seeing quite a different landscape in, the, in this space. But, but I think what's even more important than the data, and of course data then leads to volatility, and obviously quality data should hopefully lead to a more resilient model. But uh, what I think is very important in, in selecting the model that will become the benchmark is, is that we focus on, res we focus on stability. Uh, what we don't want is to kind of go through the same problems that we have with uh, the implementation of IFRS 9 where the system was supposed to bring more robustness to, to the, uh, the balance sheet, but had a major perverse effect is to bring volatility into the calculation of the provision. And what it led to is a counter cyclical effect where when the economy tanks, banks are required to shore up their provisions and therefore cannot play their role of active economy supporters and lenders in a moment of distress where most companies need it. Uh, so we want to make sure as well that uh, banks are still able in the future to play their role of, of financial providers, um, particularly in those sectors, in the sustainable sectors that the, the banks are very well um, aware that they need to support uh, from not just purely from an ESG perspective, but also from a financial viability, because we know these are the areas that will be um, financially viable in the future. We want to make sure that the model developed is sufficiently resilient and stable so that we can take this long-term view in investment uh, 
uh, and we are not facing that uh, constant volatility in provision that could hamper the business. Yeah, that that's an interesting point. Um, you know, and, and I suppose also we will see banks, um, you know, continue to reduce their exposures to carbon intensive uh, companies over over time as well. Um, which which I suppose is, is another element that maybe sh uh, needs to be built into scenario analysis and, and stress testing approaches. Um, is this uh, also seen as, as a major challenge? Uh, because obviously the, a lot of these changes will occur over time. We might not know about them now. Um, how, how does a bank go about kind of uh, addressing those and, and accounting for them in their approaches? Well, I guess every bank is different and, and we, you know, every bank has its own strategy as to what they are doing with their current asset and and what yeah essentially uh, their strategic planning for for assets but i think what is important is to striking a good uh, balance uh, between your long-term prospect and your long-term relationship with your client and your current exposure and how it will fare in the the evolution of the current market i think it, it it's always been extremely important to uh, uh to large financial institutions that have been uh, in the market for a long time to, uh, to, to, to put a lot of value in the, in the relationship that have been with their client and not you know and accompany their clients towards change towards where the economy is going. So I think yeah it, it's about striking a balance uh, in, in my view. Yeah. yeah absolutely uh, well, I think um, I think at the moment a lot of the stress is basically again on everybody finding their bearings and also um, complexity will be introduced more over time but now it's really about comparability and and indeed like Eve said finding a kind of um, let's say an, an average within those models which can can be suit can be suited to start off from and over time I think banks will indeed include their strategies uh, look at energy mix changes that will come with that uh, sector changes and, and additional complexities like, uh, for example, the stranded asset problem, uh, where, for example, you have uh, issues, uh, for example, in Europe, what we see is that um, um, go, uh, policies basically say, you know, from within the next five years, you need to, everybody needs to, to, to change cars eh, for, to an electric vehicle. Uh, and what does that mean to those collateral values of those cars currently being loaned or leased so uh, that brings additional problems with them as well and then i think to the other extent and that's also a risk that uh, that comes more and more in the in, in, the, in the foreground is um the, for example if a bank suddenly starts to invest more and more in green uh, projects as well as governments there might also be uh concentration problems in, in some of those uh, aspects um if, if a certain overfunding happens in one specific technology and that technology is not adopted by consumers or doesn't make the finish line, uh, think about the whole uh, hydrogen versus electrical car uh, discussion, then that also might have an effect, a reverse effect in the form of a, a green bubble. So uh, those complexities, I think it's too early to, to basically bring them into the model, uh, but they will come eventually and that mm -hmm. will go through different several iterations. Yeah, so it's, so it sounds like this is this is really going to be an evolving situation. It looks like you have a, a lot of work ahead of you um, next year. Um, uh, Frederick, um, from a technology perspective, um, how, how do you see banks um, might might need to be changed, I guess, over time, changing their systems um, to, to be able to meet uh, regulatory expectations around climate risk modeling, stress testing, scenario analysis, and so on? I think uh, whatever financial institutions uh, anticipate, it's probably going to be worse. Um, uh, but uh, no, joking aside, I think uh, what, what's important here is that uh, there will be normally uh, frequent changes from the regulate, regulator coming around. There will be new modeling approaches. There will be new data requirements. So I think that's that's a key element. So don't look at this at, as a one-off project, but as a continuous program. So as I said before, everything is still in the cradle of things and we'll have to go through different iterations eh, to bring this to a level of maturity where basically everybody feels feels comfortable with. The IFRS 9 example that Eve just uh, also um, uh, related to, I think is a very good example. It's, uh, it also still is going to a certain maturity phase. It's still not there. 
So, and the same thing uh, in a worst case scenario, um, if, if we don't act, uh, it might also be that climate, um, yeah, climate disasters come at us. Eh? Like we had financial uh, disasters in, in the past, and this will come with, with waves of regulations like we had with, with the Basel. So mm. um, it really depends on uh, yeah, the transition, I would say, as, uh, as well. Uh, so the, yeah, the, 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 there are different aspects and variables in play. Um, but it's going to be uh, at least something that will stick with us for the next 10 years, for sure. I guess speaking of of Basel, uh, what would you say are your expectations for how um, eventually climate risk stress testing um, could eventually figure into bank capital requirements? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. So um, currently, uh, everybody's looking at pillar three. So I think we're, with that report, um, a lot of additional information will be need to be added to that uh, and then in the longer term i think pillar one will also be affected and uh, a way of potentially doing that is looking at um, again at the probabilities of defaults but uh, let's say a more standardized approach where data comes from external parties uh, but also there might be a, um, a way of looking at more internalized approach and, and that might be also uh, a good idea, especially for, let's say, the larger banks to think also about, yeah, this is gonna stick around for a while. Maybe it might, might be also a good idea to incorporate that in our internal modeling. And so that also there, we can also, let's say, benefit, but also have a second view on things so that we don't put everything, all our eggs in one basket uh, and to make sure that we have um, a, an approach which, which is flexible enough for the future. Yeah, um, I wonder if Eve has a view on that as well. Um, I was I was asking about, um, you know, how climate risk stress tests will eventually uh, figure into bank capital requirements. Well, I think it's inevitable. Uh, we know this is going, but I think uh, rightfully so regulators are taking a, a prudent approach to that, as, as we discussed earlier. It's about, you know, finding resiliency in the model, finding common ground. And once this will be the case, and I think we're, we're not too far away from that, maybe a couple of years, uh, this will eventually become reality. But I think banks, if not, if they're not, they should, but they, they need to be well aware of how their current exposure is going to affect their capital in the future and, 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 and take strategic decisions based on that. Uh, but definitely this is coming. And yeah. Yeah. So, so we just have a, a, a couple of minutes left. Um, uh, it's, I, I suppose, you know, some of the, the, the key conclusions from this discussion are, are you know, we need to sort of uh, hopefully address the, the regulatory fragmentation issue, uh, get greater alignment and harmonization across jurisdictions. Um, and a lot of that uh, relies on that cross-border coordination and, and guidance from regulators at the local level. Um, I, I wonder if you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave our listeners with um, just in the final few minutes. Um, maybe we can start with you, Frederick. Um, what, what are your, what would you, um, would you, what would you advise to banks uh, that are kind of looking to build in these approaches to to their current systems? Um, yeah, as you've already mentioned as well, and you summarized very well. I think is that in the short term, we definitely will go to a kind of convergence way of looking at things, and in the longer term, uh, things will be probably also adding certain national discretion. Uh, certain uh, local elements to that to that approach, and when it, when it comes to um, yeah investments and thinking about this and about data requirements, I would say yeah make sure you 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 uh, install the people, the investment, and surround you with uh, uh, technologies, data, and and people who can really help to make this work, not only in a short term point of view but also in the longer term point of view. Mm -hmm. I think things are already starting to heat up, eh? no pun intended. Uh, but if if you look at this as from, let's say, with an analogy from, from a banking world, so yes, we will probably need to pay interest, but the longer we procrastinate, we probably have to pay more interest or penalty interest on, on this topic. Uh, not only the banks, but basically the whole whole world. So I think it's very important to, to, to take this very seriously. Mm. 
thank, thanks, Frederick. Um, Eves, any final thoughts you'd like to leave? It? No, I mean, I'll, I'll echo what Frederick said. Of course, don't wait. Uh, and, and then a second thought is uh, keep it simple. Uh, keep it simple. Uh, take it one step at a time. Uh, don't shove it under the rug, uh, waiting for a perfect model to come into place. Uh, th this will take time. You want to be part of the journey. Uh, uh, speak to non, you know, uh, non-profit organizations that are currently working on developing models. There are a lot of organizations out there, so learn from them uh, and 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 try it. Start to see the the more you will learn about your existing exposure, the better you will be prepared to uh, to implement the uh, what will in the future become the norm. Uh, so yeah, don't wait. Keep it simple and and learn from it. Thanks, Eve. That, that's a, a great place to, to leave the discussion. I, I, you know, I, I'd be very interested to kind of revisit the discussion in a year's time and see how we've progressed. Um, obviously, a lot of work ahead for both of you in the year ahead. Uh, thanks so much for your time today. Um, I know we've only scratched the surface. Uh, but again, a special thanks to our listeners as well for tuning in. Uh, if you have any questions for, for Eves or Frederick, feel free to reach out to us um, and we'll be happy to pass those questions on. Um, so thanks once again. Have a good rest of your afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much.